This is uh, my grandmother, Bridget Rochford. And uh, I remember her from the time I was five years old till I was 15 when she passed away. But she was, uh, had lost her eyesight by the time I got to know her, so she never regained it. Well, uh, I knew her. But she lived with uh, my Uncle Jim on the farm, on the original farm. And uh, Uncle Mike uh, served in the World War One. He promised he had great devotion to the Blessed Mother, he promised her. When he got, when he got back safely to the United States, the first thing he was going to do was go visit his mother in Ireland. So he went to Ireland, and uh, it was a big disappointment for him to find that his mother couldn't see him. Oh, he didn't know. No, nobody had told him that she had lost her eyesight. He got there, so that was a big disappointment to him. Yeah. All, all I remember was, when we were little, um, maybe about five years old is probably the time, we uh, didn't live too far away. We would just go across the fields, you know, to go down uh, there, visit. And she would put her hand on top of and see how much I had grown, you know. And it's, she couldn't see us, so she could only tell by, you know, how tall we were, how much we had grown. That's all we remember. But she smoked a pipe, so oh. we used to light the pipe for her and she always made her own bread. She she could make it up to the room where she would get the flour and she had this one recipe that she knew how to make and she uh, we would put it in the pan. Us girls would say I was the oldest girl my, and my sisters when they came along they would do it and, uh, put it in the pan and uh, watch it so that it didn't burn. It was always good. You'd always get the taste of it. But she, that's what she lived on. You know, she probably had her porridge in the morning and then the rest of the day. That's what. That's what we just lived on bread and potatoes. <laughs> Cullinacton was our village. That was the village. There were thirty-three homes in the village at the time I grew up. And. Uh, Jim remained on the farm and uh, married, and he had two children, a boy and a girl. The boy died in London uh, at a young age. Mm -hmm. I was not. And his daughter Mary is uh, married, and she's living in Cabin at the moment. Willie also uh, lived uh, a next, on the next farm to us. And uh, he had two children. Uh, he had two, and then about ten years later, they had three more children, and uh, three of them ended up in Chicago, and uh, two are in England. The, uh, his oldest son, well, he, he had one son and four daughters. His son died a few years ago, and uh, his daughter. One daughter lives in Chicago, and the other daughter passed away too in Chicago. But uh, the other two girls are in England. So that. Uh, then the remainder of the Rowans are Rowans in, uh, in Toledo. My brother discovered that when the girls went to school, they spelled their name R U A N E, and the boys spelled it R O W A N. Also uh, found out that. The oldest member of the family, Tom, spelled, always spelled his name R-U-A-N-E, and his brother John spelled his R-O-W-A-N. So, uh, and my mother was always R-U-A-N-E, so it was hard for me to come here and find everybody was Rowan, Rowan. <laughs> but I found that looking back, the name, both names were used. Well, that was the only one that uh, my brother uh, discovered from looking at the census that the girls spelled their name R-U-A-N-E and told the teacher, you know, and, and the teacher wrote down R-U-A-N-E and, and the boys had a different teacher, so we wrote R-O-W-A-N, so 
Well, it's on the Gaelic. Rowan is the Rowan is Gaelic, you know. So Sabina, of course, when um, we have uh, Mike and Martin and Sabina and Dina all uh, married in Toledo and raised their families in Toledo. So that was Tom, John, and Patrick. And Delia, or they called her Beezy. Maggie, who was the one that passed away when she got here, and uh, she's buried in Delaware. I'd love to go visit her grave. Jim and Willie, because this probably might have been taken before they were married. They were both married? They both married, okay. yeah. And uh, Jim uh, had a boy and a girl, and the girl is still living in Cavan. I see her every year when I go back, and Willie had uh, five children, I guess I had the two. The, that, was that the first Three of them went to Chicago, and two were in England. These are Mike and Martin's brothers. Their dad's brothers. Grandpa Joe, yeah. Oh, okay. Technically, their descendants should come to the Rowan reunion here in town. Oh yeah, yeah. But they don't. They don't live here. Uh, uh, no. Uh, Willie's uh, daughter lives in Chicago, but she never comes. Uh, when his son was living, he used to come with my brother John. But they worked in England together, and they were good friends. And he was the oldest. Mike. He was. Uh, he was like a brother to us. He was always in our house. And, uh, but uh, the girls, um, yeah, he's been here a few times. But she, she died of cancer years ago. That's Jim and my mother here. Yeah, the same photo. Mark and Dan Swinford. <laughs> this is Sabina. Oh, yes. I never did meet her. She passed away, but uh, my brother Pat was emigrating to Toledo, and uh, he just had received a letter from Aunt Sabina saying that he could stay with her. The next thing we found out, she was in the hospital. She was having surgery, brain surgery. And she died on the operating table. And uh, so then my brother, Uncle Mike, said he could stay with, with him. So we never did get to meet Aunt Sabina. This lady here, this is Uncle Mike's wife. Okay. Is Uncle Mike in that picture then too? No. These are, these are the, uh, her husband and his brother. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. This was our first Christmas. And, in Toledo, we had at Uncle Mike's house. There's Mike and Mary, and that's her sister Kate. She worked for the Spitzer family. She never married. Uh, that's what most of the Irish women didn't know then. That's Mike's uh, son, John. There's another John Rowan. <laughs> and there's uh, Mike's daughter, Jean. The other, the twin was in the convent time. They've done 1232 Burdan, I always remember that. <laughs> I always look at it when I come down Burdan, 1232 Burdan. Because we used to write letters, you know. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you don't remember that anymore because you don't write letters. 542 yeah. Colburn was Uncle Martin. <laughs> yes, this is when they served. Oh, this is Uncle Mike when he served in. World War I. Oh, that's Uncle Mike? Yeah. Oh, this is Uncle Martin. I think Uncle Martin went over, but he wasn't uh, involved in the fighting as much. They just got here and were drafted right away. Oh, you're kidding. Mm -hmm. And who was she married? Who was Martin married to? What was Rose McTague. 
to I used to live with them when I first came here. I lived on Coburn Street for two years with them. I just loved her. We used to play we used to play uh, solitaire, double solitaire until one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and she loved bingo. She used to <laughs> she she would take me to bingo. I didn't know anybody here. And Rosemary was in college and uh, that first year that I came here, it was, I, I was so, so homesick and I didn't know anybody and just go to work and so anyway she'd take me to bingo. I hated bingo. <laughs> but you would play anyways. bingo again. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I remember going to see her at the hospital and she was just feeling so bad about Marty, you know, but um, to say goodbye. Having to say goodbye for good, you know, is, is sad. Your dad and Uncle Martin. And, uh, oh, I had a letter that Uncle Mike wrote when he went back. Uh, he went back. I went back after I was here about four years, 1953, 54, 50, 52. I went over in 52 and came back in 53. I was home for Christmas. So then Uncle Mike went in 1954. Well, Uncle Martin went also at the end of 1953 and set in Rosemary. And uh, <coughs> I just found a letter that he had written, and I had some photos. He uh, threw a party for the neighbors, and my mother was still living in the thatched cottage. Oh, you know? was she? Yeah. And uh, he uh, went into, he said he was going to get a couple of niners and throw a party for the neighbors. So. I found the photos that uh, with some of the neighbors in there and them having the drinks, you know, and they made copies of, I first sent a copy of the letter to Marty, and he said, who is the letter from? And then I, I found the, the photos later, so I <laughs> made some copies of the photos and I sent the copies to him, so it was great, you know, because it mentioned in the letter about the, and it showed the bottles, and I was at the <coughs> Walgreens making copies of the, of the photos, they were black and white, and was the manager that was working on a Saturday. There was hardly anybody there. It was the first nice day we had here, so but nobody had worked there at Walgreens. And uh, he, said, he said, black and white. He said, when was that? Was that? I said, the 50s. He said, when did the color come in? The 70s? You know, he was looking at the black and white photos. And, and then he saw the battle, you know, and he said, was, was that a brewery? I said, no, it's a party, and I went to a party. <laughs> and my uncle went back and he threw a party. <laughs> they know how to throw a party. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. My mother, well, I heard that uh, she stayed home to help her mother. That's why she didn't uh, emigrate. When Jim got married, and the, she got married to a farmer about next door to where she grew up and uh, raised six of us. She always corresponded with her brothers Mike and Martin and Joe and she talked a lot about Joe because uh, Joe was next to her in line so they probably played together more than the older ones. She had uh, had gone to England and I followed him to England and uh, he was there about a year and a half and then we got a letter from Uncle Mike saying he would sponsor Pat to come to Toledo and uh, so Pat decided to leave England and come to Toledo and uh, about a year later he wrote to me and said Uncle Martin would sponsor me to come to Toledo if I would like to come. He said living conditions were better, you know, housing and everybody had a car. <laughs> so so I followed him to Toledo. So that's how we came here. Now uh, how uh, Delia came, she was the first member of the family to, to come to Toledo and settle down in East Toledo on Clark Street. Good Shepherd Parish was the Irish parish then. But, uh, her story is that he followed the railroad to Toledo, so. That's, that's 
and when the memory of the Rowans ended up in Toledo, you felt it be there. Mike and Martin and Joe. And family, small farm, you knew you had to immigrate. Uh, getting away from it, but I, for, yeah, I believe he, I thought he was born in 1846, my grandfather. So I was, you know, how did they survive, you know, the famine? They had a farm, yeah, but it was very poor land. Oh, you could only, you know, I'm talking about mayo. 15 acres. Oh, I mean, you know. You couldn't you support a family about hands. Two cows. I mean, that's what we had. And half of it was rocks. And uh, you, you could just grow enough potatoes and uh, have two cows and two pigs and uh, a few chickens. So you had eggs, but my mother would save the eggs to take to the store so she could get money for the eggs so she could buy the tea and sugar and the flour. So that was the most, the three ingredients that we used because uh, besides the potato, bread, that was our, we lived out in the country, we, didn't, we weren't running to the store right. for any food. You had whatever you had, and, you know, when the, when the potato failed, that's why. The blight, right? And, and, and back in those days, they were having you know, these large families, and uh, there was eight million people living on that island. And How many is it now? Do you know? Uh, well, it was down to two and a half million, but now it's back up to four. Oh, is again. it? Yeah, it's, now it's going down again. Is it going down again? The young people are emigrating again, just like we did. And the educated ones are off to Australia or wherever. So they can't come to America. I couldn't even bring my nieces here. Oh, you can They changed the law since I came. You have to be a brother or sister, a blood relative. What, uh, during, when you came here, did you need a sponsor? Yes, Uncle Martin sponsored me. And Uncle Mike sponsored Pat. And when did you become a citizen? Five years later. Okay, so you... Because I was looking at my grandpa's, Joe's. And yeah. He was like 38, and I... I think he came here when he was in his 20s. You were there when uh, my grandma passed, your grandma passed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I was about 15 when we were going to her funeral. She was old for your grandma, though, wasn't she? Pardon? The 80s when she married? No, about 77, I think. 77, okay. Yeah. She used to smoke a pipe, clay pipe. A lot of the older women smoked it clay pipe, a pipe at that time. She used to get, have to get her tobacco for her. <laughs> and Willie used to make our coats. He was a tailor, so we would uh, make suits, you know, for the men, so for the ladies he could make a coat. And that, but uh, clothes weren't uh, anything that you get already made you just had to buy the material and take it to a dressmaker you know those dresses that we're wearing in this photo remember going to the dressmaker and just picking out the pattern and <laughs> I found out this dressmaker she only had one style that she liked and then another new dressmaker came on the scene and we were so happy I remember my sister Bridie and I for Easter yeah she had brown and I had blue and it was and I should have had the Brown, brown was a better color for me and blue was you know because she had dark hair and I had, I had the brown hair. <laughs> Joe was the baby of the family and uh, he followed everybody else to Toledo. <laughs> I don't think he ever went to England. Uh, uh, the others, uh, Mike and Martin had been in England and worked on the hay, uh, seasonal work as teenagers, you know, when they were 18, 19, because I remember Tom telling me and pointing out, said that's where 
I walk in the fields and the Irish came over there. They worked on hay, they showed me the farms, English farms that they worked on. Summertime they'd work on the hay and then in the fall they'd they pick the potatoes for the English farmers. Oh. And have to save up the money and survive until the next season. Oh. Yeah, my father had to do that too. Because he wasn't had enough money to survive. He didn't, he didn't sell any milk. He just had enough milk for yourself, you know. Right. Eggs were the only item that they could sell, or they, they had uh, some baby calves where they could sell those off. It was amazing. They, they survived. I know. Yeah. Especially with her being blind. That's amazing. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I don't know how she walked all. I said at what age. Yeah. Okay, the other nosy thing I want to ask about is the house. When we were kids, we went to Ireland, and we went, could see the house. The house is still standing in perfect condition. And um, but we do have a picture of the homestead. Yeah. And um, so what is what is the deal with that now? Is it still in the family? Yeah. Uh, oh, um, one of the neighbors bought the property. When was the last person who lived in the house? Would have been Jim, Jim's wife, Mary. Yeah. And when did she pass? 67. Okay, so no one Just in. after we were over there with our kids. Oh, okay. 67. So no one lived in 67. So we went in probably 73, 74. Yeah. So it was still pretty nice. Would have been too bad. Yeah. I was probably eight, nine years old, so I would have a good memory. We always were from the beach. Yeah. Maybe it was locked, I don't know. Because it seems we, we hopped the gate. Yeah. There, there would have been bars. We might have, we might have jumped over the gate. Or yeah. Because yeah. kids would probably get the bus. Probably would have. Yeah. Oh, probably. <laughs> a big holly bush there people used to come at Christmas time to get the holly it was a very no so it further. went right to the neighbor or right I no further holly bush it was about 20 30 feet tall so do you think when I was there in the early 70s it was already belonging to the neighbor at that point uh oh probably oh that was yeah yeah it probably was sold well this is John Rowan Senior, the father of the uh, 14 children. He was married to, first to Nora McManus, and they had six children. This, I think the only other thing we can talk about is you remember in the earliest, the early Rowan reunions. Oh, is that 1955? Is that where the first one? I think so. Yes, I, well, maybe not. Probably was my first one because I think I remember Kevin was a baby. I think I had the photos of being there with the baby. <laughs> <laughs> Where was all the reunions at? Do you remember? I know. I don't know where that was from. My mother was over from Ireland. She came for one. She yeah. came over again in 1976. I think she made about three trips over there. And she and my dad came over that year in 1955. That's the first time I think that she came. I had a first cousin here in Toledo by the name of Maurice Collins. And I wrote to him and asked him if he would sponsor me. So, uh, which he did. My brother, that was the oldest, and he first went to England and worked there. 
and then he emigrated to uh, Toledo. He was sponsored by my Uncle Mike. So after being here a year, he wrote me a letter. This time I had also gone to work in London, and uh, he had written saying that uh, living conditions and working conditions were better in Toledo, Ohio. Everybody owned their own homes and cars. Mary Ann McNulty and Morris Buckley came to Toledo well after the Irish had established themselves here. They had family in the States, and many others had come before them. But that didn't completely ease the pain of emigrating. At uh, my mother's house, uh, all the neighboring women came in to say goodbye to me. And I, it's one time that I won't forget because I, as I was saying goodbye to them, I thought about they also saying goodbye to their own children who had emigrated years before. And of course, in those days, not many of them ever went back. I arrived in New York on Memorial Day, and there were uh, a few other young people from my area on the boat, so we became friends. And uh, we got on the train in uh, New York then to come to Toledo, and most of the others were going to either New York or Boston or Chicago. And when they asked me where I was going, I said, Toledo. And they said, where's that? So that made me <laughs> worry about where I was going to be. Nobody had heard of it. It's always that feeling you're going to more or less the unknown, even though you have uh, cousins or friends uh, in the area you're going to, you're still this, this new and uh, it's unknown. But Morris and Marianne found that the Irish Americans had not let their heritage die. And Toledo's churches, pubs, and social organizations offered a little bit of Ireland to ease the transition. They gave them a feeling of belonging where they could uh, more or less uh, continue with their own way of living, you might say, uh, socially. Organizations like the Knights of Equity did a good job getting the Irish together in Toledo. They did such a good job with Marianne and Morris that the two ended up Mr. and Mrs. Buckley. The flat, swampy plains of Northwest Ohio must have seemed impossibly far from home to the early Irish immigrants, just as far as Ireland now seems to Toledo's Irish Americans. They've built comfortable lives on the foundations their ancestors laid. And this city is their home. But still, it's nice to visit the old country, if only for a while. And if only to see how far they've come. For me, um, I guess it would always be my home. Wherever you uh, spend your childhood, you always go back there in, in your mind. It's easy to do it in your mind, but to do it physically, it's not, not that easy.